Hi. After looking at the Tower of Babel story, where with only a few verses and a handful of words, the authors uh, construct an incredibly intricate story of human rebellion against God and the questions of civilization and unity. Now we come to something very different. And don't just stop reading, listening here. Of course, if you weren't interested, you wouldn't be listening to me even right now. But we get to a genealogy. And my hesitation there is it's easy for Western eyes and ears to just roll and close in the context of a list of so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so and the enormous number of years. And we've seen several of those already in Genesis, as you can see in the chart that I have on the screen today. Because we're not going to look specifically at the, at the Genesis text itself in my Bible program because the bigger theme is the overall role of this as it situates itself between the Tower of Babel story and the emergence of Abraham and Sarah in the next uh, chapter 12. And so a number of things we have to look at. First of all, as you can see here, there are a number of these uh, genealogies. Toledot is the Hebrew word for it, and so you see those there. And uh, following Michael Fishbane's use of the first five of these, uh, showing that each of the Toledots comes after a major episode. And I want to suggest as well that that's true uh, all the way through. I added six and seven of that. So at the end of the Abraham and Sarah cycle, and then the Jacob, Rachel, and Leah cycle, we have another genealogy. For classic older scholars like von Rod, though a passage like that we're going to look at today in 10, 11 to 26, we won't go all the way through 32, as you see on number five there, for reasons we'll look at today and next time. Um, uh, he skipped over this completely because he was so committed to the source analysis, as we've seen, that showed that the Tower of Babel story was a J or Yahweh uh, passage, and the genealogies are priestly passages. And so he skipped over that and he went directly from, from the... Uh, Tower of Babel to the call of Abram in chapter 12. But more recent scholarship has recognized that these things are much more tightly integrated than older scholars like Von Rod realized. And we're going to see explicitly how that is today, with ours connected specifically to the flood story and connected to the previous one in chapter 5, which was connected with Genesis 1. And one can argue those are all uh, priestly passages and they all fit that the criteria if we are still following the question of sources. Uh, but they've also been tightly integrated in the wider text by whoever the editor was that put them in their final place. Uh, and one of the key things here is the link between the primeval history and the Abraham cycle, as we're going to see. And let's look at the comparison of Genesis 5 and 11 and see just a little bit of how that works. So I've put in bold here the pattern you can see. So for the first one um, is Seth and the, and on the left, and the first one is Shem on the right. And we see that they're both uh, connected to an event. So the Genesis 5 one is connected to the original creation, uh, the creation of people in the likeness and image of God, as we saw uh, in the very first verses of the book in chapter 1, and especially in 127 or in 28. And here we see connection with the flood. So became the father of Arphachad two years after the flood. And so as you'll see in a minute, I date the ages of these people to their relationship with the flood. So clearly coming after that, and with the call of Abram at the end, or the, at least the announcement of the birth of Abram at the end, we see an expression of hope. That despite all the evil that humans have done, despite the fact that Yahweh regretted making humankind and brought upon the flood, which was a failure to change human nature, and despite the, the Babel story, which refused people's uh, obedience to God's call to scatter and spread across the earth, but rather be concentrated in one place, still God is providing that there's a hope for human beings in this list of descendants that will lead to who we know already, Abram, and his wife Sarah, who will produce family that will uh, establish a tradition that much, much later might be called something like Judaism. And we'll get to that next video when we look at an overview of the Abraham cycle before we get to chapter 12. So let's look a little bit at the particular Toledot of Shem here uh, in this form. So what I've put here is that taking the data we just saw, the years of each of the patriarchs at the birth of their first son, and then how long they lived. Notice something about these that it says that in each one that they gave birth to so-and-so and then had more sons and daughters who are not named, at least not named in Genesis in the Hebrew. And we'll see more about that later. Uh, so we see this, and this produces uh, a surprising outcome, which is that Shem, the longest living of all these, lives until the flood plus 502 years. O only one uh, goes longer, but he started later, and it's, curiously, it's the exact same amount. Um, actually, not quite the same amount. He was born at 34, but he wasn't. But but Shem wasn't 34 when he was born, so ignore that. But if we were to look down to here, all of these people are alive at the same time. 
Uh, this is not a precise timeline, as you can see in terms of the correlation, but we can roughly see that uh, Nahor, who lived only, quote, only to be 376, was still alive at the time that his many generation ancestor was here. And so there's a certain convergence in all these. We also note that they're much shorter than the ones in chapter 5 that we saw. We can go back to that and just briefly see. So you see, for example, the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and yet the years we're seeing here are under 500 for the most part, and getting smaller, which is part of a tradition out of the Babylonian cultural context, out of which the priestly author would have been writing by all measures, um, that from the time of the primeval kings in the kings list back to the ancient Babylonians ancestors, there was a decline in the length of human beings' lives. And we'll see that when we get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose uh, lengths of lives are longer than we mostly experience, longer than we ever experience. Abraham is 175, but obviously way shorter than any of these here. And so, what is the significance of each of these uh, ages? Well, I'm not going to get into the, the numerology of it. Um, Umberto Casuto did an enormous effort in looking at chapter 10, um, which again, whether we see it as a Yahwist or a non-priestly um, source, is using a principle that is not necessarily crossing over to these others, which was that he saw them all as uh, making fun of or relating in some way to the B Babylonian base 60 number system. And I showed some of that when we looked at chapter 10. Uh, whether one can contribute, can um, convert all of these numbers to something related to a base 60 number system is questionable, uh, and I'm not going to try to do that. But this is also not the only list of them. Um, and before we get to that, let's just finish looking at this chart, and we'll see the comparison. So we see the post-flood birth years here. All this is taking us 300 years, 327 years of life from the power of, from the flood to where we are. Uh, when we look at the Abraham story, the overview of it, most scholars who are trying to take the Abraham story as somehow related to actual historical events would have put it in the second millennium BCE, which is to say roughly 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. But if we're talking about creation, plainly that doesn't, that doesn't match up. And it certainly doesn't match up not only with the literal name, numbers, but obviously with what we know through other sources of how old the earth is. The authors of Genesis obviously weren't concerned with what we can know from modern science. They're trying to convey something about their social life and their relationship with God and the people around them. So let's keeping, keeping these in mind, let's look at the other versions of this. So here's the Septuagint version. The one I just showed you is from the Masoretic text. Obviously, it's in English. But the Septuagint, as my note here, has greatly expanded years. So you can see those all here. And I'll show you a chart comparing that in just a moment. Um, and um, then there's the one in First Chronicles, which does it very differently. Lists the same people, but omits how old they were, but adds the various siblings, but not all of them. If we look at this just for a moment, we see the descendants of Shem. This is several generations here, and then all these other people, who are they? And then it goes to Ar Arkpashad, who became the father of Shelah, as we see in Genesis. And Shelah becomes the father of Eber. But now we have two sons from Eber, Peleg and Joktan. And then we see the list of Joktan's sons in great length here for several verses. And then the other names that Genesis has uh, just listed one after another without any description. So what's going on in the chronicler's mind there? We'd have to ask somebody who's a scholar of Chronicles, which I'm not. Um, but just to note that it's also out there. And then finally in the New Testament, we have the Luke version, not the Matthew version, who traces Jesus simply back to Abraham. It doesn't go before that. But Luke has these following the Septuagint, which adds Canaan here um, to the one that was not in, uh, in the Hebrew version. And that leads us to see it uh, this way. So we can see the ages of the people according to the Masoretic text, extracting the numbers in the chart I just showed you, and then these from the Septuagint, which mostly it takes the, the year of the father when their first son was born and adds a hundred to it, but not always exactly, but pretty much like this one plainly is different than that. And then adds these much longer names, uh, uh, lists of years rather, not names, but sometimes they're the same as we see in these several, but then these are, are different and sometimes shorter than longer. So uh, whatever the pattern is there, I don't know either. Um, but what's important about all of these as we look at them is that it's showing a sense of continuity. 
uh, that there's this link between this time of so-called primeval history of these early events without any particular important characters other than Adam and Eve and, and Noah, um, and then establishing a link to something that we might call history. Uh, in the sense of family stories in relation to the peoples around them, in particular places that we could actually put on a map. That's not to say that the stories we're going to look at are quote-unquote historical in the sense that they have some relationship with what really happened, but that's a question for another, uh, another time, and we'll get to that a little bit next time as well. So, as we prepare to enter into the Abraham and Sarah cycle, um, important to note that we are dealing with patriarchal text. This only shows the men, it doesn't show women, and so the fact that Abraham's Abram's uh, wife Sarai, later Sarah is named, is already shifting a little bit from that. But I'm going to be emphasizing the importance of the women because we don't live in a society that accepts patriarchy as something that's the status quo that we want to preserve but are trying to look like, like so much of the Bible is and like Genesis itself does in chapter 1 to an equality on, in gender that reflects the equality of gender in God. So next time, bring whatever presuppositions you might have about who Abraham is, and we'll explore how that plays out, both within the Bible and beyond, as we enter into that story. See you then. Bye-bye.